dramatic video shows first responders evacuating residents at an assisted living facility in Mississippi. You can see them here being led through the rising floodwaters. The state has been hit with torrential rain as a strong storm system continues to pummel the south. Rob Marciano is tracking the storm. President Biden announces his plan to forgive some student loan debt. The amount may be determined by the type of loans and also depends on your income. Education Secretary Miguel Cardona joins us to talk about the new plan and whether any more relief could be on the way. Independence Day celebrations in Ukraine take a dark turn when the country is hit with a Russian rocket attack. President Zelensky says more than a dozen people were killed and even more wounded. Ian Panel reports from Ukraine. After a school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, left 19 children and two teachers dead, the school board is now determining the fate of the district's police chief. And it comes exactly three months since that tragic day. The results for Tuesday night's high-stakes elections could point to a key issue in deciding the midterm elections, abortion rights, the role it's already played in primary races, and the impact it could have in November. A new law signed by President Biden is set to make major changes to the health care system as many struggle to pay for their prescriptions. On blood thinners, on certain uh, cholesterol medicine I've been on, they've been in the two to $400 range. What will this really mean for your budget? A look at the changes we can expect. I thought this was an emergency. A fashion emergency. She once played a gossip girl, but now she's a real life rock star. Taylor Momsen opens up about her music career, being a teen TV icon, and her mental health journey. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. It does get better. Just wait it out, baby steps, and you will get to the other side, and that's a wonderful thing. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the major move by President Biden to keep a campaign promise easing student loan debt for roughly 43 million Americans. The president making the announcement this afternoon at the White House. The top line, those earning less than $125,000 a year will be able to forgive up to $20,000 in student loan debt. Biden says it will give working and middle-class families some much-needed breathing room. The president also moved to extend a pause on payments for all borrows, borrowers. Many are cheering the move tonight, but the plan also faces sharp criticism on all sides. Some say it's still not good enough. Others say it's unfair and will only exacerbate inflation as we're just three months away from the midterms. So what else is in the plan and what do you need to know if you are one of the millions of Americans with a student loan? Chief White House correspondent Cecilia Vega leads us off tonight with all the details. President Biden today announcing what could be life-changing relief, saying his move to cancel student debt would entirely wipe out loan balances for some 20 million Americans. I made a commitment that would provide student debt relief, and I'm honoring that commitment today. The president promising assistance for the overwhelming majority of people with outstanding student loans by forgiving up to $10,000 for individuals earning less than $125,000 a year or couples making less than $250,000 and forgiving up to $20,000 for low-income borrowers who receive Pell Grants. It also extends the federal pandemic pause on student loan repayment through the end of this year. And the president is proposing that people with undergraduate loans will be able to cap their payments at 5% of their monthly income. People can start, finally crawl out from under that mountain of debt to get on top of their rent and their utilities, to finally think about buying a home or starting a family or starting a business. It is a massive relief to people like Nick Fuller, a teacher from Michigan who graduated in 2018 with over $60,000 in debt. It's lifted a huge part of the stress in my life away. But in Texas, Sharifa Mason was hoping for more. She's the first in her family to graduate college and has had her wages garnished by the government due to her loans. I know that there needs to be more done simply because black women in this space uh, are hit with the student loan debt more 
disproportionately than any other demographic. And Republicans like Senator Mitt Romney call President Biden's move an attempt to bribe the voters, saying it fuels inflation and foots taxpayers with other people's financial obligations. Minority Leader Mitch McConnell calling it astonishingly unfair and a slap in the face to every family who sacrificed to save for college, every graduate who paid their debt. Cecilia Vega joins us now. Cecilia, how soon will Americans experience this relief? Well, Stephanie, I have some good news potentially for some 8 million Americans because they could automatically qualify because the Department of Education already has their income information on file. Others, they're probably going to have to wait a bit. The administration is going to have to create a new form. Then folks will have to submit that to see if they qualify. And I, and I got to point out right now, Stephanie, this is important. This income cap that we're talking about, this only applies to the years 2020 and 2021. And anyone who took out a loan after June 30th of this year, Stephanie, they are not eligible for this relief mm, just the other day and you spoke with Susan Rice earlier today who is the White House domestic policy advisor did she give any insight as to how much this relief is going to cost taxpayers yes. Yeah, the, the White House doesn't have that information right now, much to the frustration, I think, of many Republicans in Washington who are very concerned about the price tag for all this. But, Stephanie, listen to this. We just a few minutes ago got some new information from a nonpartisan budget group. They say that this move could cost taxpayers some $500 billion over the next decade. Well, this relief news certainly welcomed by a lot of young people. Thank you, Cecilia. Cecilia Vegas for us there at the White House. Joining us now is the top person when it comes to the education system in our country, Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona. Secretary, welcome back and thank you for being here. It's a very busy day for you. Happy to be with you. First off, today is obviously a big day for the 45 million Americans with federal student loan debt. Finally, some relief when yes. it comes to student loans, right? But tell us why and how the government decided on 10 to $20,000 of relief and a salary cap. Sure. Well, look, the goal of this is to make sure that Americans are not worse off than they were before the pandemic. And we know that 90 percent of the money going here is going to go to people making less than seventy five thousand uh, dollars. So that's significant. We know middle class Americans, those who are struggling financially, are having a hard time um, paying loans. And we know that we want to avoid defaults when loans restart in January and we think uh, $10,000 in loan forgiveness for anyone making under $125,000 is the right thing to do and if you're a Pell recipient meaning you know you qualify because of uh, your low income you're eligible for $20,000. Absolutely this is great news for so many Americans the lump sum is great but is this a one and done kind of solution what about the reduction of interest rates right. would that be more of a long-term option to provide everyone? I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, loan forgiveness, the $20,000 in loan forgiveness is getting a lot of attention and, and it should. No other president has done anything close. But I'm just as proud of the work that we're doing to improve income driven repayment, which means we're not going to ask folks to pay more than they can afford. So we went from uh, requiring folks for their undergrad degree to pay 10 percent of their of their income, their disposable income down to 5 percent. That means half. Half of their payments uh, are going to have to be made now. And lastly, we're going to continue to fight to double Pell. We know that Pell helps level the playing field and give access, it gives access to more people uh, from lower income communities to have access to higher education. Secretary, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I believe you said about 90% of Americans would benefit from this. Why not make this it kind of uh, for everyone so that everyone yeah. could benefit from this as opposed to having a salary cap? Sure, 90% of the money will be directed toward people making under $75,000. That's significant. What that does is level the playing field to those who are most impacted by the pandemic. This is targeted relief to make sure that folks are not worse off after the pandemic than they were before. The income driven repayment and the public service loan forgiveness is for everyone. So we want to make sure that everyone takes advantage of that by visiting studentaid.gov uh, and learning more about it. What's your message to those who didn't attend college because it was too expensive or did manage to pay off their debt and now feel they are, quote, footing the bill for others? Well, look, this is very consistent with what we did during the pandemic to uh, uh, other groups, right? Uh
small business owners needed a little bit of support and we provided that to keep them open and keep them in business and we're investing in americans right now so to those who've paid for it you know we're targeting those who are struggling right now to help get them on their feet and that helps everyone because when you have less people defaulting on loans that helps everyone's economy and, and Secretary, you're the first Latino in your position, felicidades. According to the Student <laughs> Bar Protection Center, about 90% of black Americans and 72% of Latinos take loans to attend college, compared to 66% of white students. Now, regardless of race and ethnicity, higher education has more than half of our youth in debt. Right. How are we making this a better system? Right, and really, this has this is not partisan, right? We want to help Americans. On the long-term policies that we're working on, public service loan forgiveness, income-driven repayment, we're making sure that it's affordable. So some of these first-generation college students or uh, families that, that have modest means they too have access to the American dream through higher education. Let's talk about what's next. While the move has been celebrated by the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and by We the 45 Million, which is a student loan activist organization, their wording has been very specific. They said this is a great first step, but what's next? Will there be more? What strides are we making? Look, uh, keep tabs on what we're doing. This announcement today wasn't the first one. We've forgiven over $32 billion in loans um, from day one since this president took office. That's more than any other administration combined, right? Uh, we're fixing a broken system, public service loan forgiveness. There was a 98% denial rate. We got that number up. We've forgiven over $10 billion just in public service loan forgiveness. Keep holding us accountable. We want to make sure higher education is ac accessible to students across the country. Uh, but there are also concerns that this will just make inflation worse. We have to hit on that before we let you go. When making this yeah. decision and adding up those numbers, how much of a focus was placed on inflation? Well, look, number one, when someone is struggling and close to default, you know, talk about helping them is going to give them a little bit more uh, money in their pocketbooks to help with their regular costs, their mortgage or, or whatever payments they have. And then if you look at reports from, you know, Moody's and others, there's an offset here because those making over $125,000 are going to restart payment uh, in January, which means $4 billion is going to be pumped into that. That's going to lower uh, the inflation. Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona right there for us at the White House. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate Thank you. it. Take care. Tonight, we're also following a flash flood emergency in Jackson, Mississippi. The National Weather Service calling it a dangerous situation, and it was all hands on deck just east of Jackson in Brandon, Mississippi. People were rescued from a flooded assisted living facility. Others were seen navigating high water and the rain still coming down. Tonight, this slow moving front is threatening areas all along the Gulf. Trevor, Trevor Alt is in the storm zone. Tonight, the urgent race to evacuate an assisted living facility east of Jackson, Mississippi. Workers telling us waist high water was rushing in from every entrance. The whole thing's probably two and a half, three feet deep inside the area. First responders and Good Samaritans guiding more than 40 Peachtree Village retirement home residents and staff through filthy, fast moving water, gripping onto a rescue line, slowly brought to higher ground one by one. We continue to see volunteers, firefighters, even state troopers coming in to help uh, pull out whatever they can. We got everybody out, and that's the most important thing. Yeah. So everybody's safe. And south of Jackson, more than 100 children and employees rescued from this daycare facility. The National Weather Service declaring a flash flood emergency, calling it a particularly dangerous situation. This is a completely flooded highway in Forest. The drainage system simply cannot keep up. Police have closed this off. They said they've had to rescue multiple people. Look at it. And in Hattiesburg, this possible tornado spotted that slow moving system already plaguing the region for days, dropping up to a foot of rain in parts of the state. Trevor Alt joins us now and Trevor, those incredible scenes at that nursing home. How are those people who got rescued doing tonight? Well, Steph, thankfully, they are all doing okay. They're at least healthy. But remember, these are frail senior citizens, and all of them were soaked from the waist down. Officials actually told me they had to bring in blankets from the nearby jail to keep them all dry and warm. Now, some of these seniors are going to be staying with family. We watched as they got picked up. Others will be moved to different nursing facilities. As while it's sunny now, more rain is expected to move through the area. Stephanie? Thank goodness those seniors were rescued. Trevor, thanks for that report.
ABC's senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking this system. Rob, what can you tell us? Well, we're stuck in another one of these patterns, uh, Stephanie, where things are just kind of not moving. And this is the sixth state now, Mississippi is, that has seen an extreme rainfall and flooding event in the last five weeks. Alabama's getting some of the action right now as well. We've got flash flood warnings that are ongoing there, also through Pensacola, Florida. Uh, and that flows watches are up, in some cases, through at least tomorrow. Waves developing along this front, that's kind of the trigger. It's bringing in moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. That's what produces those heavy rains. Our computer model's kind of showing where we expect those to happen tomorrow, maybe sinking a little farther to the South along I-10, along the coastline, but some areas we'll see another three, four, maybe five inches through Friday. And as we've seen all summer long with these flash flooding events, when our rainfall rates get aggressive like they did again today, we see more flash flooding when that threat is going to be ongoing in the next couple of days. Stephanie? That rain just relentless. Rob, thank you. You bet. Tonight, as Ukraine celebrates its Independence Day on the six-month anniversary of the war, President Zelensky says at least 20 people were killed in a Russian missile strike on a rail station in the center of the country. The U.S. has also announced its biggest round of military aid worth $3 billion. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel joins us from Ukraine. Tonight, as Ukraine celebrates 31 years of independence, President Zelensky telling the UN a Russian missile strike as a rail station in the center of the country, killing more than 20 people, including an 11-year-old boy and wounding at least 22. Ukrainian officials posting photos showing what they say is the scene of the strike. ABC News can't verify the photos. The attack follows US and Ukrainian warnings that Russia would step up its attacks on civilian targets today. President Zelensky marking Independence Day with a defiant message, saying his country was reborn the day Russia invaded. Today, the Biden administration announcing its largest single aid package for Ukraine, $3 billion in weapons and equipment. Zelensky saying U.S. aid will help them to get more of the weapons they need. And overnight, multiple strikes on Kharkiv, seen in this video posted online. And the toll for Ukrainians mounting. 9,000 Ukrainian soldiers and more than 5,500 civilians have been killed. And nearly 7 million refugees have fled Ukraine. Ian Panel joins us now from Kyiv. Ian, we are six months into this war, and some have wondered if Ukraine would cede some territory in the eastern part of the country to Russia. Does that seem to be on the table? Yeah, I mean, I think many, you're right, had expected Ukraine to be forced into a corner to give away Donbass in the exchange for peace. But Zelensky's adamant that that isn't going to happen. Instead, they want to retake not just the Donbass, but also Crimea too. Remember, those areas have been effectively occupied by Russia since 2014. Six months in, and this war looks set to grind on at least well into the winter. Stephanie? Unbelievable that it's been going on for so long. Ian, our thanks to you. So good to see you. To Texas now, and that high-stakes meeting in Uvalde exactly three months after the horrific shooting that killed 19 students and two teachers. The school board determining the future of the school's embattled police chief, Pete Arredondo. John Quinones is in Uvalde tonight. Tonight, after months of calls for his resignation. Your boy Pete, he dropped the ball big time. 77 minutes! Uvalde School District Police Chief Pete Arredondo facing termination. The school board meeting in a closed session to decide his fate. Arredondo criticized for his lack of leadership during the shooting, telling the Texas Tribune that he never considered himself the scene's incident commander. A blistering report stating a command post was never set up, leading to a breakdown in communication between officers on every level. Arredondo testified before the committee that the officers prioritized evacuating children over taking down the attacker, stating, we have this guy cornered. My thought was, we're a barrier. Get these kids out. Body cam video inside the school showing Arredondo's attempts to talk to the gunman. Please don't hurt anyone. It was Border Patrol agents who breached the classroom, killing the gunman, but not until 77 minutes into the attack. 
Our thanks to John Quinones for staying on top of that story for us. The midterm election matchups are nearly all complete tonight after the last major primaries of the season last night. And the race for a vacant House seat in a swing district in New York may be a bellwether. Democrat Pat Ryan defeating Republican Mark Molinari by making abortion the central focus of his campaign. Here's ABC's congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Everybody for Pat Ryan. Tonight, a surprise Democratic upset in a key congressional race. A new sign abortion could be a driving force in the midterm elections. Democrat Pat Ryan of upstate New York winning Tuesday after making abortion rights his central focus. When the Supreme Court ripped away reproductive freedoms, access to abortion rights, we said this is not what America stands for. His Republican rival, Mark Molinaro, reading from the GOP campaign playbook, urging voters to focus on inflation and crime instead. It does a disservice to the people of this district to be focused on anything other than they're concerned about the cost of living, they're concerned about safety in their communities. That message falling short. Ryan securing a victory in the swing district President Biden won by fewer than two points. Republicans should be very, very, very scared this morning. It comes after voters in Kansas, a conservative state, overwhelmingly rejected a move to strip abortion rights from the state's constitution. In the weeks after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, 70% of newly registered voters in Kansas were women, according to Target Smart Insights, a Democratic data firm. The group says there are similar surges in key battleground states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, where the percentage of women registering to vote for the first time outpaced men by about 12 points. ABC's Rachel Scott joins me now. Rachel, Democrat Pat Ryan, as you mentioned, won that race in New York. He also campaigned on the major themes of this election, inflation and the economy, but he made a strategic decision to zero in on abortion rights. He, he really did, Steph. I mean, this is someone that is a West Point graduate. He served two tours in Iraq, and he did campaign on leveling the playing field, fighting inflation, but he made it extremely clear that choice was on the ballot this primary election, and Democratic turnout exceeded expectations, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Rachel. For more on last night's primary results, let's bring in ABC News political director Rick Klein. Rick, always good to see you. Let's start with New York. Congressman Jerry Nadler came out on top in that battle in Manhattan between incumbent members forced into the same district. But is redistricting helping Democrats at all as they try to hold on to the House? No, look, this was a disaster, frankly, for Democrats. What happened in New York is they essentially got greedy. They tried to carve up a, a, a map that would allow their incumbents to uh, to survive and that would allow them to, to pick up a couple additional congressional seats. And then you had a judge in New York throw that all out, throw everyone into chaos and forcing these two longtime friends and rivals to run against each other. Uh, there used to be two members of Congress from opposite sides of, of Manhattan. Now there's only going to be one, and it's Jerry Nadler. On the same night that Florida had this new map that elected some new Republicans almost certainly uh, this fall, uh, Democrats are, are losing some ground in states like New York. They're losing a seat, and in this case, they, they had two incumbents go down. Okay, so let's look outside of New York City and toward uh, November. We saw the Democratic candidate come out on top in a House special election for an open swing seat outside New York City. And it does appear that Democrats have some momentum right now when it comes to these open races. In your opinion, what could that mean for November? Yeah, Stephanie, what's interesting is there have now been four special elections in a row where the Democrat outperformed the expected performance in the district, uh, did better in this case than Joe Biden did just two years ago in a presidential year when Trump was very unpopular in, in large parts of the country. Uh, and the way that it got done in this case and in some of the other races is that you had the Democratic candidate saying explicitly abortion rights are on the ballot. All four of those special elections happened since the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade. And of course, we saw just three weeks ago the vote in Kansas that that surprise in a, in a ruby red state to have an affirmation of abortion rights. What it means to Democrats is they think they've got a winning message, something that can motivate their voters, uh, get them out there, get them caring about the stakes of a midterm, even though the economy and so many other factors are, 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 are weighing down on the uh, incumbent party. Uh, the Supreme Court decision may have breathed new life into Democratic hopes, and their hope is that they can replicate what just happened in, in New York yesterday in a whole host of, uh, of marginal districts, places where they are fighting to hold on to their members or maybe even picking up some places.
Okay, so let's talk about the race for governor in the state of Florida. This is one that I'm actually really looking forward to. It's going to be interesting to see it play out. It is set now between Ron DeSantis, uh, now facing former Governor Charlie Crist. Some interesting dynamics there, but does Crist really have a shot? Look, it is a closely divided state. Uh, Ron DeSantis won by only about 30,000 votes. Um, races always tend to be close there. Now, they've been trending in the Republican di direction, and Ron DeSantis has become quite a popular figure, certainly inside his party, even by some outside his party. And an interesting comment today that might define the early stages of the general election, Charlie Crist uh, asked at a news conference uh, what he says to DeSantis voters, and he said, essentially, I don't want him. Uh, I think that if you, you believe in him, then you're not going to believe in me. That's an odd message from someone who obviously got a lot of those same voters when he was the Republican governor of the state. But the point for Charlie Crist is he's a known quantity, and Florida Democrats went overwhelmingly to someone that has been there, literally been there and done that before, and they hope can be sort of a Biden-esque figure in the state, uh, bringing a moderate brand of politics uh, to a state that has seen uh, some, of, some of the more divisive political issues play out uh, right on their footsteps. So many different dynamics. We will be watching it all right there with you, Rick. Thanks so much. Thank you. When we come back, see the chaotic moments. Emergency crews worked to remove a car that was stuck on a staircase. And actress turned rock star Taylor Momsen gives a rare interview talking to us about how a profound loss is not only serving as inspiration for her new music, but also her healing journey. Many feel they're being buried under the weight of prescription drug prices, but a new U.S. law promises to ease the burden. Devin Dwyer breaks down the impact it could have on your budget. That's coming up. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. Here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on the tough questions with straightforward reporting. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. 
It's been a little more than a week since President Biden signed into law the Inflation Reduction Act, taking historic steps to fight the climate crisis and also making major changes to our health care system not seen since the Affordable Care Act. Tonight, we're taking a closer look at what they could mean for your health care and family budget as key parts of the law now come into focus. Here's ABC's Devin Dwyer. After decades of promises to curb skyrocketing costs, Democrats say relief from health care inflation is on the way, especially if you use prescription drugs. This is a foot in the door for uh, health care cost, cost containment. When will people start seeing the savings? Starting next year, drug companies will be penalized uh, if they increase prices faster than inflation. Americans spend more on their prescriptions than anyone else in the world, on average $1,200 per person per year. When we met Laura Marston last year in D.C. Most of these vials are expired. We saw firsthand how the soaring price of insulin these days, which is around $300 a vial, means having to save every last drop. I feel like I live in a country that prides itself on freedom, but I don't get to be free because at 14, I was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic. Starting next year, millions of diabetics on Medicare will pay no more than $35 a month for insulin. Good news for retirees like Sue Milliken. I don't think anybody's happy with how drug prices have gone up. The Ohio grandmother says drug price inflation has been eating away at her fixed income. And the other drugs that I'm on have gotten very expensive on blood thinners, on certain uh, cholesterol medicine I've been on, they've been in the two to $400 range. But under provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act, by 2025, Sue and 50 million other American seniors won't pay more than $2,000 a year for all their prescription drugs combined. This cap on out-of-pocket costs for drugs will help the sickest people uh, on, on Medicare. So these are people with cancer, people with, uh, with HIV, people with blood diseases. The cost can, can really run up quickly if you're taking these expensive drugs, and, and this legislation will provide relief. The law also means big savings for taxpayers, an estimated $288 billion over the next decade, thanks to government now being able to negotiate down some drug prices for the first time starting in 2026. Everyone would feel it through a couple different channels. In some cases, it would mean less out-of-pocket at the pharmacy. Uh, in some other cases, it would mean less that we'd pay for prescription drug coverage. The motion is adopted. It's a historic change embraced by large majorities of Democrats, Republicans, and independents, even as drug companies lobbied hard against it. This Inflation Reduction Act is a lie. And every Republican lawmaker voted no. We want to allow innovation. I'm a doctor. So the fact that people can't afford their insulin, I am very aware of. I'm also very aware that part of the price inflation when it comes to insulin is not the price coming from the drug company, but rather the extra price added by the pharmacy benefit manager. Of course we make profit, but it's not like we keep it, right? We return it to shareholders who give us money to take huge risk on R&D. Lilly CEO Dave Ricks told us last year, though the company makes billions in profit, government-mandated lower prices will soon mean fewer experimental drugs coming to market. Five of the six medicines approved globally to treat COVID are from American companies, two from mine, and three out of the three vaccines that are used globally are from American companies. One independent analysis forecast there will be two fewer drugs developed over the next 10 years because of the law and that launch prices of some new drugs could be much higher. I can see where it's happened in other countries where it limits how many drugs they get, when they get them how fast you can get stuff. And I don't want to see that happen here. What we really don't know is which drugs uh, might not come to market as a result of, of lower prices. You know, will it be groundbreaking treatments or, uh, you know, just me two drugs that don't really offer a whole lot of uh, improved health? For Laura Marston, the law is a major milestone, but with limited impact. As a patient who depends on insulin to survive, it wasn't as fantastic for us. That's because most Americans not on Medicare won't see any immediate change at the pharmacy. Those on private health insurance like Marston could still see prices climb sharply. Uh, over $2,000 worth of insulin. One in five insulin users pay over $35 a month for their supply, and that new $35 monthly cap won't apply for most of them. You know, health insurance is not guaranteed 
but I need insulin without a doubt for the rest of my life. I really implore Congress to, to seek out and introduce solutions that help diabetics and patients across the board. With the midterms approaching, further quick action by Congress is a long shot. And some states are acting on their own. 22 have capped insulin copays, but only for those on state insurance plans. Remains to be seen whether Democrats are able to, to build on this and, and expand the scope. Really important information. Thanks, Devin, for sharing that with us. Still ahead, how many millions in jewels a lawsuit says thieves got away with while the driver was allegedly asleep on the job. And remembering the life and legacy of a Super Bowl champ and a football legend. Extreme droughts and devastating floods caused by torrential rain. How some regions are experiencing both that by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, the first one-handed player in NFL history, Shaquem Griffin, announces his retirement. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. We've reported this summer that much of the western U.S. is suffering extreme drought. And we've been telling you about extreme flooding in the same region. So what's happening? We set out to explain a bit by the numbers. More than 70% of the western U.S. is experiencing severe or extreme drought conditions. In Texas, a dried out riverbed exposed previously unknown 113 million year old dinosaur tracks. The Dallas area was more than 11 inches behind in annual rainfall last week week, then up to 16 inches of rain inundated Dallas-Fort Worth in a single day, submerging entire neighborhoods, as you can see there. This type of rain hasn't been seen in a thousand years. It's flooding that has just a 0.01% probability of happening in any given year. But in the past five weeks, the U.S. has seen five of these extremely rare events. Rainfall rates topping two inches per hour in eastern Kentucky caused rivers to rise 11 feet in in just five hours. The floods killed 38 people. 
7.87 inches of rain pounded St. Louis in just six hours during the morning commute. Eastern Illinois got hit with up to 13 inches of rain in 12 hours. And Death Valley, California saw 1.46 inches of rain in one day. That's nine months worth of rain for the driest place in North America. What's the connection? Just one degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature allows the air to hold 4% more water. Today's temperatures are nearly two degrees warmer than pre-industrial times, but the effect multiplies as storms build, meaning a 10 to 20% increase in precipitation totals. Adding to the pain, soil hardened and parched by drought is less able to quickly absorb moisture, increasing the likelihood of flash flooding when the heavy rain comes. Pumps. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. The huge milestone a teen pilot just marked months after his sister did the same. And why one of the stars of the new Game of Thrones prequel series is speaking against comments made about his casting. But first, here's a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. so much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. President Joe Biden announcing a plan to cancel a portion of student loan debt for millions of Americans. All this means people can start uh, finally crawl out from under that mountain of debt to get on top of their rent and their utilities to finally think about buying a home or starting a family or starting a business. The Biden administration's student loan forgiveness plan forgives up to $20,000 if you went to college on Pell Grants. For other federal loan borrowers, the plan will forgive up to $10,000. Democrats see this as a potentially galvanizing issue for young people ahead of the midterms, while Republicans are blasting it as an unfair handout. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell calling it student loan socialism. I believe my plan is responsible unfair. It focuses the benefit on middle class and working families. First Lady Dr. Joe Biden has tested positive for a rebound case of COVID-19. She's in Delaware and has not had a re-emergence of symptoms. She tested negative during a routine test yesterday. Biden first tested positive on August 15th while vacationing in South Carolina with her husband. She had cold-like symptoms. She was put on a cycle of the antiviral drug Paxlovid, which can trigger a rebound case of COVID-19 in some people several days after a negative test result. President Biden tested negative today. Stunning new details about a massive jewelry heist in Southern California last month. 
A new lawsuit claims one driver was asleep when thieves targeted a Brinks truck at a rest stop, and a second driver who was getting food spent nearly 30 minutes away from the truck. 13 jewelers say the stolen gems and watches are worth $100 million. Brinks says the jewelry was valued at less than $10 million. Most of the certified diamonds um, do have uh, serial numbers engraved in the stones. You need a microscope to read it. A lot of this is trackable. How did this happen? A suspected car thief's journey took an unexpected turn. Emergency services in Madrid shared this video of a stolen white Mazda stuck on the staircase of a metro station. Local media reported the car was stolen from a nearby parking lot after the owner left the keys in the ignition. The getaway driver was not hurt, but did test positive for cocaine. Firefighters did manage to remove the car. The NFL saying goodbye to Hall of Fame quarterback Len Dawson on the team with the Kansas City Chiefs when they won their first Super Bowl in 1970. Dawson played well, completing six of his first seven passes in the game. Pump it in there, baby. Just keep it trickling the ball down the field, boys. A steady Chiefs offense and a stingy Chiefs defense put Kansas City ahead at halftime. But the Chiefs blew the game wide open in the third quarter when Dawson hit Otis Taylor on this 46-yard TD pass. Nice going, Lennon. Nice going, baby. Nice going, baby. It was overwhelming. It's just, you know how that relief comes when, you know, it's, it's over with and you've been successful? That's the feeling that I had when I came off the field. Got back to Kansas City for the parade. Now, that's another story. At age 41 in 1976, Dawson retired from playing. Len Dawson dead at the age of 87. A 17-year-old is now the youngest person to fly solo around the world, doing it all in this small plane. Mac Rutherford, a Belgian-British teen, landed in Bulgaria to cheers. So I'm trying to show with this trip that young people can make a difference. You don't have to be 18 to do something special. Just follow your dreams and they'll eventually come true no matter what age you are. Talent seems to run in this family. He flew in what's called a shark, which is the same kind of aircraft his 19-year-old sister used when she set the record earlier this year for the youngest woman to fly solo around the world. His remarkable journey took five months. And we've got some breaking news right now. Jurors have just reached a verdict in Vanessa Bryant's lawsuit against Los Angeles County. The county will have to pay her $16 million in damages. She accused first responders of sharing scene photos of the helicopter crash that killed her husband, Kobe Bryant, her 13-year-old daughter, Gianna, and seven others. Jurors also awarded $15 million to Bryant's co-plaintiff, Chris Chester, whose wife, Sarah, and 13-year-old daughter, Peyton, also died in the 2020 crash. Turning now to the new hit show, House of the Dragon. Days after the record-breaking premiere of the Game of Thrones prequel, one of the stars, Steve Toussaint, is addressing racist comments made by some viewers about his casting. Chris Connolly reports. All those fire breathing, air raising, dismemberable moments on HBO's Game of Thrones prequel, House of the Dragon lighting millions of viewers. Its first episode, a mix of the old, the even older, and the new. Those shipping lanes should fall. It will beggar our ports. New, like Corliss Valerian, a lead character played by Steve Toussaint, whose casting has put a micro-slice of the audience on tilt, appalled, it seems, at the sight of a black actor front and center in a fantasy drama. This is fiction. This is a made-up world. This is a made-up family. This is not rooted in reality. So characters can actually be Black, White, Asian, Latinx. They can be all types of people. The British acting standout, speaking out about the invective that's targeted him, telling The Hollywood Reporter he didn't feel like his being cast was a bigger deal until I was racially abused on social media. And then I thought, okay, this means a lot to some people, but I can't allow that to bother me. I swear this by the old gods and the new. Earlier this year, more of the same kind of racist claptrap aimed at actress Moses Ingram. Where is she? As she was featured in the Disney Plus Star Wars series, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Ewan McGregor, who played the show's title character, posting support for his co-star. We stand with Moses, we love Moses. And if you're sending her bullying messages, you're no Star Wars fan in my mind. 
There's no place for racism in this world. Star Wars feature film principals like John Boyega and Kelly Marie Tran also found themselves on the receiving end of this garbage. While to Men's Health, House of the Dragons Toussaint, underscoring the absurdity of those objecting. It seems to be very hard for people to swallow. They are happy with a dragon flying, but a rich black guy? That's beyond the pale. When it comes to looking at pieces of entertainment content and all of a sudden you're seeing people who look like your neighbors or your colleagues or your coworkers in spaces where you're not accustomed to seeing them, that's a good thing because it wasn't happening before, but it's happening now and that should be embraced, not, not cast aside and not disrespected. Incredible that comments like that are still being shared in 2022. Our thanks to Chris Connolly for that report. From child star to teen TV sensation to rock star, Taylor Momsen has been in the public eye since she was two years old. Over the years, her growth has been less of a transformation and more of a journey to revealing her true self. In her first face-to-face -face interview in years, our Phil Lipoff had the chance to spend time with the singer-songwriter to talk about life, loss, and all that lies in between. Here's tonight's Prime Playlist. On a stage in Toledo, Ohio, Taylor Momsen, lead singer of The Pretty Reckless, is back at it in more ways than one. Just nine shows into the band's first tour in five years, it's like no time has passed. But ask Taylor, and she'll tell you she's lived a lifetime in those five years. Tremendous success, coupled with deep, painful depression. Well, first of all, thank you for doing this. No, thank you for having me. This is also her first face-to-face -face interview in five years. Taylor began her life in front of the camera shortly after she learned to walk. My mom's a good cook. This is how you make shake and bake. I was very talkative. I think my modeling agent said she should go on auditions because she's very chatty. Her big break at the age of five. Where are you, Christmas? Why can't I find you? Adorable Cindy Lou Who in How the Grinch Stole Christmas, starring right alongside Jim Carrey. Then, years later, an even bigger break. I thought this was an emergency. A fashion emergency. Landing the role of Jenny Humphrey on the CW teen drama Gossip Girl. I don't think I need you as my mentor anymore. Just a teen herself at the time, fame came fast and wasn't always fun. I was getting photographed as my character and being put in the tabloids as Taylor Momsen's wearing this, Taylor Momsen's doing this. And so I got very frustrated with that. So when she was old enough, Taylor took control of her life and went from teen star to teen rock star. No more acting. Her 2010 debut album, Light Me Up, a bit jarring for some who knew her as a child actress, though she seemed to embrace it at the time. Does what I'm wearing seem to shock you? Well, that's okay. Cause what I'm thinking about you is not okay. Still, there was much more buzz about what she was wearing than what she was writing. It's the songs, those last forever, and that's what I put all my heart and soul into and slaved over, and no one's even mentioning that. But the Pretty Reckless pressed on. Taylor and longtime writing partner, guitarist Ben Phillips, continued to write. The band's sophomore album was a hit. The song Heaven Knows went platinum. Oh, Lord, heaven knows we belong way down below. Sing it. 2016, releasing Who You Selling For with hits like Take Me Down. Death, a common theme through much of her music, and it was death that stopped the rock powerhouse in her tracks. Black hole sun, won't you come? On tour with Soundgarden at the peak of her career. Rocker Chris Cornell died last night while on tour in Detroit. His representatives say Cornell's death was sudden and unexpected. Cornell, a rock idol for Taylor, found in his hotel room, death by suicide. I wasn't prepared for it. Like, I, I didn't know how to kind of mentally wrap my mind around it. Soon after, the band would cancel the rest of the tour. Time off, needed to grieve and regroup. I was starting to write some songs, and I, was, I called Cato, and uh, I said, hey, man, like, I have some stuff. I don't know if it's for a record or for what, but, like, we, we all need to get out of this funk. Taylor calls Kato Kandwala her best friend, her family, her
her musical soulmate. It's hard to overstate his role in her life, a huge part of the band's success, too. 11 months after Cornell died, just as they got back into the studio, Cato was killed in a motorcycle crash. I fell into a very, very dark, deep hole of depression. You had thoughts? Like, you, that, at that point, that wh why bother living? Why bother trying, I think. I was like, everything I love is dead. What's the point? A question she would ask over and over while isolating herself from the band and from the world around her. It just, it feels like that's, that's where you live now. That's where you are. Um, there's no light at the end. There's no, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. And, and if there is, you can't see it. But slowly, she began putting much of what she was feeling into her latest album, Death by Rock and Roll. <laughs> Writing as she has done for the better part of 15 years with Phillips. I would almost go so far to say as I think it might be our, our best accomplishment to date. Um, it is. It's, it's much like the first record. The first it record it's very, was... It's very inspired. was very inspired. Inspiration so desperately needed. The irony, Taylor says, Death by Rock and Roll might have saved her life. I think anyone who's struggled with depression or substance abuse or both will, can attest that when you're in it, it seems like this inescapable place. A place so many have been to, and tragically, some never come back from. How would you tell someone to begin to live again? Oh, man, that's a big question. And the answer, at least for Taylor, is complicated. But the reason she's sitting here today it's never going to go away. It changes you as a person. And, but what it will do is it will turn into a scar, and it will heal. That healing for Taylor continues, moving forward, touring again, and just two hours before taking the stage in Toledo, even indulging a longtime fan, playing her song Just Tonight. Laughing, living, and creating again. <laughs> Twelve years after her first album, her love of music and performing is as strong as ever. So yes, she has a few more of those scars. She describes scars that are now just part of who she is. Coming full circle, writing about love now for a song two members of Soundgarden helped record. Love, love, love. And if you or anyone you know is struggling like Taylor has, it is so important to hear her say this after she describes going to hell and back. There is light at the end of the tunnel. It does get better. Just wait it out, baby steps, and you will get to the other side. And that's a wonderful thing. Our thanks to Phil for that in-depth interview with Taylor. We're so glad to see she's doing okay. If you or someone you know is struggling, you are not alone, and there is help available. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline provides 24-7 free and confidential support. The number is right there on your screen, 1-800-273-8255. And we do want to mention that Taylor's band, The Pretty Reckless, dropped their new video for the single Got So High. That's this month. You can find it on YouTube. Now, before we go tonight, the image of the day, a sign of unity as Ukraine marks its 31st Independence Day. In a park in Lviv, people paint blue and yellow, the colors of the Ukrainian flag, on a white canvas as part of the independent campaign. We've seen tremendous resilience there in that country. That is our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, he served as Florida's governor as a Republican, and now he's running to do it again as a Democrat. Congressman Charlie Crist talks about his platform and why he's telling some voters he doesn't want their support. And the state now moving to ban the sale of cars that run on gas. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free.
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital. And then I just see Shimani as she was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The New York Court of Appeals has agreed to hear Harvey Weinstein's appeal of his sex crimes conviction in Manhattan. Weinstein has until October 18th to file a brief to begin the process. The disgraced film producer has argued certain testimony allowed at trial was improper, and a juror who wrote on a novel about predatory older men should have been disqualified. There was no immediate comment from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Weinstein is currently jailed in Los Angeles, where he awaits trial on sex crimes charges. California's Air Resources Board is set to vote tomorrow on a measure that will ban the sale of gas cars by 2035. New rules will also require 35% of all new vehicles sold in the state to have zero emissions by 2026. That's just a few years from now. The state is hoping to speed up the transition to electric vehicles. And home prices are falling for the first time in three years and the largest single month slide since 2011. The mortgage data firm Black Knight reports home prices fell more than three quarters of a percent last month. The biggest drops are along the west coast from San Diego to Seattle. Now to the major move by President Biden to keep a campaign promise, easing student loan debt for roughly 43 million Americans. Many are cheering the move tonight, but the plan also faces sharp criticism on all sides. Some say it's still not good enough. Others say it's unfair and will only exacerbate inflation as we're just three months away from the midterms. Chief White House correspondent Cecilia Vega reports. President Biden today announcing what could be life-changing relief, saying his move to cancel student debt would entirely wipe out loan balances for some 20 million Americans. I made a commitment that would provide student debt relief, and I'm honoring that commitment today. The president promising assistance for the overwhelming majority of people with outstanding student loans by forgiving up to $10,000 for individuals earning less than $125,000 a year or couples making less than $250,000 and forgiving up to $20,000 for low-income borrowers who receive Pell Grants. It also extends the federal pandemic pause on student loan repayment through the end of this year. And the president is proposing that people with undergraduate loans will be able to cap their payments at 5% of their monthly income. People can start, finally crawl out from under that mountain of debt to get on top of their rent and their utilities, to finally think about buying a home or starting a family or starting a business. It is a massive relief to people like Nick Fuller, a teacher from Michigan who graduated in 2018 with over $60,000 in debt. It's lifted a huge part of the stress in my life away. But in Texas, Sharifa Mason was hoping for more. She's the first in her family to graduate college and has had her wages garnished by the government due to her loans. I know that there needs to be more done 
simply because Black women in this space uh, are hit with the student loan debt more disproportionately than any other demographic. And Republicans like Senator Mitt Romney call President Biden's move an attempt to bribe the voters, saying it fuels inflation and foots taxpayers with other people's financial obligations. Minority leader Mitch McConnell calling it astonishingly unfair and a slap in the face to every family who sacrificed to save for college, every graduate who paid their debt. Our thanks to Cecilia Vega. President Biden is preparing to hit the road to campaign ahead of the midterms, which are now 76 days away. Student loan forgiveness and the Inflation Reduction Act are just a few of the accomplishments President Biden may try to sell to voters in key states like Florida. Joining us now is Representative Charlie Crist, who used to be governor of Florida as a Republican, but now he will take on Governor Ron DeSantis this fall as a Democrat. Thank you so much for your time tonight, sir. Thank you, Stephanie. Great to be with you. And congratulations on your primary win last night. You've, of course, uh, won you. a statewide election. But as a Republican, no Democrat has won a statewide race since 2012. What has to happen in, in your mind for you to change that? Uh, well, just tell people the truth. You know, tell them what DeSantis has done to tear apart Florida. Um, you know, he's attacking LGBTQ children. Uh, he is attacking African-American voters, making it more difficult uh, to vote in minority communities throughout the state of Florida with less drop boxes. Uh, also attacking senior citizens and their right to vote, making it harder for them to utilize mail-in voting, which my 90-year-old father, my 87-year-old mother loved to do. Frankly, I love to do it as well. Uh, but these things are what DeSantis has done and torn apart our state, not supporting public education. We're the third largest state in America, Stephanie, we pay our teachers 49th out of 50 states. That's appalling. It's embarrassing. And we have to ask, <clears throat> even though it's been about a decade since you made the switch from Republican to Democrat, but, but why? Let's remind our viewers why you made that switch. Well, it was the rise of the Tea Party uh, back then, and it's only metastasized since. And I didn't leave the Republican Party. Frankly, it left me. At least the leadership of the party did. Uh, I know there's lots of good Republicans out in Florida, and uh, you know I hope that we earn some of their votes. So I'm ready for this fight. I look forward to the campaign ahead, and I look forward to protecting a woman's right to choose. And I've already committed, Stephanie, in this race. On the first day of the Christ administration, I will sign an executive order protecting a woman's right to choose statewide in Florida. Now, you had a message for Floridians earlier today. I want to go ahead and play a little bit of that and then get your, uh, your input on it. Those who support the governor should stay with him and vote for him, and I don't want your vote. If you have that hate in your heart, keep it. So Ron DeSantis, he fired back late today saying in response to, to what you said, he says that let's stop denigrating and dividing people. Florida hasn't elected a Democrat to governor since the 90s. To win, you likely will need a broad coalition of voters. Do you think you should be uh, addressing Floridians in that way? What's the strategy behind statements like that? Well, come on, let's be serious. Anybody who's a staunch DeSantis voter is more likely than not not going to vote for me or even consider doing so. Well, how we're going to win is have a united Democratic Party, get our fair share of the independent voters and reasonable Republicans, moderate Republicans, who are telling me every day, Stephanie, that, you know, look, I'm a Republican, Charlie, but I'm going to vote for you because I'm tired of this divider, DeSantis. And, and on that same tone, on that same note, what would you say to Republicans in the state of Florida who may be a bit torn, maybe lifelong Republicans that are, 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 are torn between Ron DeSantis and yourself? Well, I understand it. Like I tell you, they approach me every single day, Republicans, telling me that this guy's too mean, he's too visceral, he's like the angry guy and, and, and doesn't seem to want to really engage with people. I, don't, I can't remember seeing a guy smile. And so, you know, I think that we're going to get our fair share of good, moderate Republican voters because they've had it with this kind of leadership exhibited by DeSantis. Let's talk about student loans, a big day for the Biden administration. And this is yeah. certainly an issue that certainly resonates with a lot of young voters, student loans. We've reported on President Biden's move to forgive up to $20,000 in student debt for certain Americans. Do you agree with this move? Did it go far enough? I agree with this move, 100%. President Biden is leading so well 
you know, the price of gas has gone down now 70 days in a row. Uh, he's just announced reducing the price of a college education. Everybody should be able to afford a college, college education if that's what they want to choose for themselves. Uh, it's wonderful what he's doing. And I, I think that, you know, thank God that Joe Biden is our president. Uh, I'm very, very pleased about that. And I, I applaud what he did today uh, in regard to student loans. It's exactly the right thing to do. Well, Congressman, we certainly appreciate your time. We wish you the best of luck on your campaign, on, the, on your race. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Stephanie. My pleasure to be with you. Now to some breaking news tonight. Jurors reached a verdict in Vanessa Bryant's lawsuit against Los Angeles County. They found that the county must pay her and a co-plaintiff millions in damages. Veronica Miracle from KABC in Los Angeles joins us right now. Veronica, thank you so much. Explain this verdict to us. Well, Stephanie, tonight that federal jury awarding Vanessa Bryant $16 million in damages. This is after she sued L.A. County for graphic photographs that were taken at the crash site where her husband Kobe and daughter Gianna died. Now, that jury also awarded Vanessa Bryant's co-plaintiff Chris Chester, who lost his daughter and wife in that crash, $15 million for a total of $31 million in damages. Warriors for L.A. County throughout the trial did maintain that they worked hard to make sure that those photos were never distributed publicly. They also maintained that they never were. That trial lasted 11 days as Bryant's legal team accused several employees from both the sheriff's department and the fire department of negligence and invasion of privacy. They alleged first responders had abused their access to the crash site by taking and sharing gratuitous photos of the victim's remains with one of those deputies allegedly showing the images at a bar and they also claimed a law enforcement cover-up with deputies told that if they deleted the photos they would face no discipline. Kobe Bryant and 13 year old Gianna Bryant were on their way to a basketball game in 2020 of January along with all of the other people on board uh, six others in uh, in addition to them when their helicopter crashed in the Santa Monica Mountains. Everyone aboard was killed including the pilot and Vanessa Bryant says she learned about the photos over over a month after that crash through media reports and she says she fears every day that her three surviving children will eventually see those photos. She walked out of the courthouse today. She went straight to her car, obviously looking very solemn and she took off today. Stephanie. That money won't bring their loved ones back, but that verdict certainly sends a message to other law enforcement officers. Veronica Miracle for us live in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for joining us on Prime. To Texas now and that high stakes meeting in Uvalde exactly three months after the horrific shooting that killed 19 students and two teachers. The school board determining the future of the school's embattled police chief, Pete Arredondo. John Quinones is in Uvalde tonight. Tonight, after months of calls for his resignation. Your boy Pete, he dropped the ball big time. 77 minutes. Uvalde School District Police Chief Pete Arredondo facing termination. The school board meeting in a closed session to decide his fate. Arredondo criticized for his lack of leadership during the shooting, telling the Texas Tribune that he never considered himself the scene's incident commander. A blistering report stating a command post was never set up, leading to a breakdown in communication between officers on every level. Arredondo testified before the committee that the officers prioritized evacuating children over taking down the attacker, stating, we have this guy cornered. My thought was, we're a barrier. Get these kids out. Body cam video inside the school showing Arredondo's attempts to talk to the gunman. Please don't hurt anyone. It was Border Patrol agents who breached the classroom, killing the gunman, but not until 77 minutes into the attack. John Quinones joins us now. And John, understandably, the community has been infuriated about the police response on that tragic day. What was their reaction today? There's a tremendous sense of relief here, Stephanie. You know, for weeks and weeks, folks have been demanding Arredondo's firing. I mean, three months ago, this was a man who was a public servant here. It's hard to believe this, right? 30 years in law enforcement. He was elected to the city council. 
And now he's considered a pariah in his own hometown. John Quinone is for us there in Uvalde. Thank you so much. That community has been through so much. Tonight, we're also following a flash flood emergency in Jackson, Mississippi. The National Weather Service calling it a dangerous situation. And it was all hands on deck just east of Jackson in Brandon, Mississippi. People being rescued out of a, an assisted living facility and so many people navigating high water there as the rain still came down. Tonight, this slow moving front is threatening areas all along the Gulf. Trevor Alt is in the storm zone. Tonight, the urgent race to evacuate an assisted living facility east of Jackson, Mississippi. Workers telling us waist high water was rushing in from every entrance. The whole thing's probably two and a half, three feet deep inside the area. First responders and Good Samaritans guiding more than 40 Peachtree Village retirement home residents and staff through filthy, fast moving water, gripping onto a rescue line, slowly brought to higher ground one by one. We continue to see volunteers, firefighters, even state troopers coming in to help uh, pull out whatever they can. We got everybody out, and that's the most important thing. Yeah. So everybody's safe. And south of Jackson, more than 100 children and employees rescued from this daycare facility. The National Weather Service declaring a flash flood emergency, calling it a particularly dangerous situation. This is a completely flooded highway in forest. The drainage system simply cannot keep up. Police have closed this off. They said they've had to rescue multiple people. Look at it. And in Hattiesburg, this possible tornado spotted that slow moving system already plaguing the region for days, dropping up to a foot of rain in parts of the state. Our thanks to Trevor. Tonight, as Ukraine celebrates its Independence Day on the six month anniversary of the war, President Zelensky says at least 20 people were killed in a Russian missile strike on a rail station in the center of the country. The U.S. has also announced its biggest round of military aid worth $3 billion. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel joins us from Ukraine. Tonight, as Ukraine celebrates 31 years of independence, President Zelensky telling the UN a Russian missile strike as a rail station in the center of the country, killing more than 20 people, including an 11-year-old boy and wounding at least 22. Ukrainian officials posting photos showing what they say is the scene of the strike. ABC News can't verify the photos. The attack follows US and Ukrainian warnings that Russia would step up its attacks on civilian targets today. President Zelensky marking Independence Day with a defiant message, saying his country was reborn the day Russia invaded. Today, the Biden administration announcing its largest single aid package for Ukraine, $3 billion in weapons and equipment. Zelensky saying U.S. aid will help them to get more of the weapons they need. And overnight, multiple strikes on Kharkiv, seen in this video posted online. And the toll for Ukrainians mounting. 9,000 Ukrainian soldiers and more than 5,500 civilians have been killed. And nearly 7 million refugees have fled Ukraine. So much heartache in that country. Our thanks to Ian. The White House has announced that First Lady Dr. Jill Biden has tested positive for COVID again in, a, in an apparent rebound case after testing negative for the virus over the weekend. The president, who had a similar experience with COVID, tested negative today. ABC's Ariel Reshef has that story. Tonight, the First Lady once again in isolation, testing positive for a rebound case of COVID after taking the antiviral drug Paxlovid. Just three days ago, Dr. Jill Biden, who is double vaccinated and twice boosted, tested negative and was cleared to end her previous isolation. A spokesperson for the First Lady saying she has experienced no reemergence of symptoms and she'll remain at home in Delaware where she's following CDC guidance. President Biden, who himself had a similar rebound COVID case after taking Paxlovid, tested negative earlier today. In recent weeks, the White House COVID-19 response coordinator, Dr. Ashish Jha, pressed over concerns of rebound Paxlovid cases, but he says they are relatively low. The clinical data suggests that between 5 and 8 percent of people have, have rebound. But health officials urge Paxlovid is preventing severe outcomes, with people who took the pills five times less likely to be hospitalized and 10 times less likely to die from COVID.
And now the FDA reviewing Pfizer and Moderna boosters that specifically target Omicron and its dominant subvariants, with officials saying those shots should be available soon after Labor Day. Our thanks to Ariel Resha for that report. And still to come, closed schools, food insecurity, and mental health struggles. Reporter Anya Kamenetz tells us how her new book is shining a light on the challenges children have experienced during the pandemic and how to handle them. Also coming up, a zoo is celebrating two new additions. Why the birth of these twins is so significant. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Okay, we made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Mourning and anger in Mexico after a journalist was shot to death in his car. Columnist Frazid Roman was ambushed by gunmen on motorcycles shortly after posting a column on a local politician's alleged involvement in the disappearance of 43 students in 2014. Organizations focused on media freedom are investigating whether his murder was linked to his profession. 18 journalists have been killed in Mexico so far this year, the deadliest on record. In India, schoolgirls are fighting for the right to wear a hijab to school. Their efforts began earlier this year when schools in some areas started banning the traditional head covering worn by many Muslim women. A group of students took their plea for religious freedom of expression to the country's Supreme Court, which is expected to rule soon. Muslims are India's largest minority. And a giant panda at a Chinese research center has given birth to two healthy babies, a boy and a girl. They are the second pair of twins born this month at the facility. Breeding programs have helped China raise the wild panda population to about 1,800. Another 500 live in zoos and preserves around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has touched almost every aspect of our lives. With so many adults struggling through this unprecedented time, what does that mean for the impact it's having on our kids? Award-winning education reporter Anya Kamenetz brings us a closer look inside the lives and homes of some of the American families that were forever altered in her new book, The Stolen Year, How COVID Changed Children's Lives and Where We Go Now. Joining us now is Anya Kamenetz, author of The Stolen Year. Anya, thank you so much for joining us. I have to tell you, I've, I've covered the COVID pandemic since the very beginning, January of 2020, and throughout the entire pandemic, all I could think about 
were children and how they were being impacted and, and how so many of them, uh, it would probably take them years to, to recover after falling behind for so long. When did you realize there were some deep problems that couldn't be addressed in a regular report? I was here in Brooklyn in my home office. I have a full-time job uh, for NPR covering the schools. I had two young children at home, three and eight years old at the time. And so I knew it was going to be a really big deal and a historical um, impact, uh, partly from my experience reporting on the aftermath of Katrina as a young reporter who's originally from New Orleans. So the schools there also closed for a few weeks and that and and you know closed for a few months. Kids were out of school for a few weeks and the impact was felt for a generation. Right, in those early months, it, it was just so difficult. I mean, with my youngest at the time was about five, in kindergarten, I mean, just imagine, this is where they're they're getting their foundation, their basis, and he's just couldn't focus on a Zoom, on a, on a, you know, on Zoom for weeks and weeks. It was very, very difficult. What, what comes through in, in your book is, is all of the unknowns about the impact of COVID-19 and schools, particularly in those first few pandemic months. You write, that the U.S. closed most classrooms for a total of 58 weeks compared with 33 weeks in Finland, 27 weeks in both the U.K. and China, and 11 weeks in Japan and just nine weeks in New Zealand. Why were we here in the U.S. such an outlier, in your opinion? We had uh, a leadership that was calling for schools to reopen on the federal level, but wasn't necessarily giving them the tools to do so. We had a public health infrastructure that was not clear about the trade-offs and the risks and the benefits. We heard so much about the risks of COVID in the classroom. We did not hear as much about how to keep classrooms open safely. And so when our peer countries were prototyping things like masks, prototyping things like hand washing and distancing, in the spring of 2020, we were doing that here too on a very ad hoc basis. Now, two years into the pandemic, many of our schools are still struggling to keep schools staffed and students cared for. You write the, the limited, inconsistent, and unequal access to in-person schooling is one of the more damaging ways that the U.S. experience during the pandemic stood out globally. Yeah. In, in your opinion, what are the long-term ram ramifications of school closings? Los Angeles Public Schools uh, says that there's 50,000 kids that were missing on the first day of classes. And so getting those kids back re-engaged, making up for not only the remote learning, but the days of absenteeism and disengagement that came from hybrid learning, from Omicron closures in the past year, this is a very urgent matter. You cite research that food insecurity tripled among households with children between April and May of 2020. You spoke with a lot, a lot of families as well. What did the families tell you about their struggles to find food and what long-term impact can, can that have on kids? One family that stood out to me was a single mother who was um, had come from Peru to San Francisco. She had a four-year-old daughter when the pandemic started and um, she had no choice but to bring her daughter on the bus with her to her job cleaning hotel rooms, which was her essential job that she kept um, when everything shut down. And she was uh, basically going to uh, pantries, to churches, standing in line sometimes for hours. And she said, I was so hungry. You know, I was just was eating whatever I had in the house. Um, and, and this was unfortunately a really common experience. You speak to a medical resident who tells you about the adolescent psychiatric patients they've seen. And you spoke with families about changes they noticed in their kids. Describe some of the things those young people were struggling with. Uh, with, with teenagers, you saw depression, anxiety becoming more acute. So anxious people having panic attacks and depress depressive people um, becoming more suicidal. People that ended up in, in psychiatric wards or in emergency rooms, they were dealing with eating disorders, substance abuse disorders, self-harm. Adolescents are so dependent on, you know, the milestones and the, the reinforcement of being with their peers and taking away that timeline, you know, I had a teenager say to me, like, it feels like the best years of my life are just going down the tubes. Um, so, yeah, it's it's just, it's devastating to think about. Now, in, in all of your reporting, you've spent so much time on this. What was the most important thing you learned from writing this book? Um, I think the most important thing that I learned was really from listening to the kids themselves, that they don't want anyone to define their experience for them. They really want to be listened to. They want to be taken seriously. And 
we can't rush in to fix their problems or define their experience for them. Anya, thank you so much for, for joining me. Really appreciate it. And wishing your kids the best school year ahead. Uh, your book, The Stolen Year, How COVID Changed Children's Lives, Where We Go Now, is available to purchase wherever books are sold. Thanks, Anya. Thank you so much. And still to come, how a woman went from the heart transplant list to a medal winning athlete. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award winning, powerful, eye opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. And finally tonight, a second chance not taken for granted. A Philadelphia woman never considered herself to be a very active person, but after more than three decades as a social worker, she was in need of a new heart. That gift of life transformed her, and now she travels the country and the world as an athlete in the transplant games. Our partner station WPVI brings us this inspiring story in tonight's Local Lowdown. I would not believe at 67, I'm still like doing a long jump, okay? Who does that? Before this transplant, my life was very predictable and I didn't do a lot of physical things. I became a social worker for the um, City of Philadelphia Department of Human Services and I did that for 35 years. So I kept trying to go to work and my heart rate kept elevating. They said a virus attacked my heart and put me in heart failure which made no sense to me. Like, I never have been sick. The last time I was in the hospital was the day I was born. You telling me I need a new heart? You have to be matched with someone else, like blood type, weight. In 2005, I received my gift of life, my second chance. I heard about the transplant games through my transplant center. I swim, I do shot put, distance, javelin, and the long jump. And that was in Spain. When I was in my 50s, they were like, oh, we could really hurt ourselves. Excuse me, I'm a heart transplant. I got heart, I'm doing this. One person can save the lives of eight individual organ recipients, but also through tissue donation can help over 100 uh, different recipients. Right now, we have over 100,000 patients who are waiting a transplant in the nation and over 5,000 here in our area. I just want them to know how thankful and grateful I am. And I'm having a time of my life. I'm, I'm doing stuff I would have never did before. It is never too late. Now she's winning gold medals. That's our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks for streaming with us. America's number one news, ABC.